Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the birdhouse. We are on the last day of May. So it's May 31st. And today we're giving an update on some of the different birds you guys are seeing. We're going to share your photos. And I thought I'd share a few butterflies that you can see out there right now, too. As always, we'd love to know what kind of things you're seeing. If you have any sightings, you can put those in the comments. If you have any questions, you can put those in there as well. Um, sounds like a lot of you guys have been having some nesting activity, which is really exciting. Um, birds are fledging, those eggs are hatching, and so there's a lot of that activity going on. Some of the birds are starting to leave. Some of those first broods from early on in the season are starting to leave the nest, so don't be surprised if you start going through more mealworms from the uh, the parents. The parents will grab those mealworms and feed them to their young, so a lot of that is happening right now as well. It sounds like people have bluebirds in their houses. Um, that with The eggs that have hatched for bluebirds, eggs have hatched for tree swallows, and some of you have even had um, some birds leaving the nest. So really exciting time of the year. We're really out of, you know, the peak of uh, migration. We were focusing early on this month about all the different birds migrating in. Um, there's some birds that you'll start to see more often right now, but for the most part, um, we are through the peak of migration. I looked at the birdcast migration maps and there really wasn't much to uh, much to write home about there. So we are through with the peak, but some of you guys are just starting to see some of these other birds pop up that you haven't seen or heard before. So they're definitely still chatting out there. Um, if you're using your Merlin app, you might pick up birds that you had no idea were around you still. And we'll show some of those off today too. But I thought I would start with a few butterflies because I've noticed there's quite a few of them out there. It seems like just over the past few days, there's been more and more. And yesterday, um, actually over the, the weekend, I was seeing lots of the tiger swallowtail butterflies. So they are out flying around as far as attracting them to your garden. We'll talk about butterfly gardening a little bit later in the season. Of course, any kind of plants that attract bees um, that usually will attract, attract these butterflies as well. The key to attracting a lot of butterflies, if you're interested in doing butterfly gardening, is to not only plant the nectar producing plants, but also what are called the host plants. So those are the plants that the butterflies will lay their eggs on. So those are important. And for tiger swallowtails, um, the host plants are kind of larger plants. So um, they're going to be larger trees, tulip trees, black cherry trees. Those are some of the, the, the types of plants that the adults will lay their eggs on. So if you ever see tiger swallowtails kind of flying high up in the canopy of some trees, that's probably what they're doing. And then the adults will, of course, sip on nectar from different nectar producing flowers as well. But tiger swallowtails are definitely out and around. Saw quite a few of them this past weekend. And then also some black swallowtail. Swallowtail, they can look a little bit variable, so they, their colors can vary a bit. Um, sometimes they have more blue or sometimes they have more yellow, so they can be quite variable. <clears throat> you can tell it's a black swallowtail because they have this little eye spot here. If you look where the red is on their wing, down at the hind wing there, they do have a little polka dot that's in there. Um, black swallowtail you can attract to your garden, of course, the same way as the tiger swallowtail with those nectar producing plants. Um, but as far as their host plants go, there's some of our common things that we plant in our garden, at least if you're anything like me, every year. So black swallowtails will lay their eggs on um, parsley is, is a big one. The Queen Anne's lace. So if you have some of that popping up in your garden, you might want to keep it because they will lay their eggs on that. Um, rue is another one, dill and fennel. So if you do any kind of herb gardening, you might just find yourself with some tiger or some black swallowtail caterpillars on those plants. And what I started to do just this past year is incorporate some of those in my actual garden. So I've got my herb garden that's kind of on my deck. And then uh, with all my plantings, uh, my nectar producing plants kind of further out in the yard, I started planting some of these other herbs um, sprinkled in to give them a place to not only 
uh, drink the nectar, but also to lay their eggs on. So we'll see if that makes a difference uh, as far as the amount of butterflies that I get. So I was saying black swallowtail uh, butterflies here, they have that red marking there with a the little polka dot in the, in the middle. So um, I brought that up because there's another species of swallowtail that looks very, very similar to the black swallowtail called the spice bush swallowtail. So they can be really hard to tell the difference, um, but the spice bush swallowtail is not going to have that little polka dot in its the little red markings here. And spice bush swallowtail, they'll lay their eggs on spice bush and sassafras are two of the major plants that they will lay their eggs on. And then you might be lucky enough to see one of these. This is called a giant swallowtail. So um, they're not going to be as common as the tiger swallowtail or the black swallowtail, but you never know. You might happen to see one around. Um, they're quite large. They're black and they've got this yellow stripe that goes through their body. So if you're lucky enough, you just might find yourself seeing some giant swallowtail as well. Those can all be found around here. And of course, the cabbage white, probably the most common butterfly you'll see in your garden. They lay their eggs on a bunch of different things, different grasses, um, different sedges, different vegetable plants. So don't be surprised if you see quite a few cabbage white butterflies because they do have such a diverse amount of plants that they can survive on. I haven't seen any monarch butterflies yet. I'm wondering if you guys have seen any yet. Might still be a little early in the season uh, because they are making their migration up north. So haven't seen any of those yet, but it's only a matter of time. Some birds you can be on the lookout for are common nighthawk. So um, this is this type of bird has been um, seen recently. Now, normally they're only active at night or dusk and dawn, um, but sometimes when they're migrating, you can see them during the day. So this is, uh, they're, they're, they're very camouflaged birds. So if you're walking through the woods, you might happen upon one and have no idea because they just do blend in so, so well. Uh, but the time, the, the time most people do see them is when they are flying during the day. And uh, they've got long, thin wings with white stripes on the wing. And then they've got that white patch on their throat, which helps you identify them. So uh, be on the lookout for them because they have been seen around the last couple of weeks. So the, that's called the common nighthawk. And cuckoos. So there's been some pretty healthy sightings of cuckoos around. Um, these, This picture here of a yellow-billed cuckoo was sent in by Bob. He says, this year's bird migration is blowing my mind. A yellow-billed cuckoo just hanging out in a tree across the road. I did not hear its call, just caught a glimpse of it flying and watched where it landed. Even with the camera, I couldn't see it, so I just took some photos hoping for the best. And voila, there's also a black pole warbler hanging out, which I can hear and captured on Merlin, but have not seen yet. So as far as the cuckoos go, they can be quite secretive and you tend to hear them before you see them. Um, we do have two species that are here in the area, the yellow-billed cuckoo and the black-billed cuckoo. And I'll play you the sound of the yellow-billed cuckoo because this is the one you're going to be most likely to hear in our area. So here we go. Kind of an interesting call there. It almost kind of sounds like a squeaky toy if I had to uh, say it sounded like anything. So that's the yellow-billed cuckoo, and it looks like it's been hanging around in Bob's yard here because then he sent in these, these photos. said, yellow-billed cuckoo, this bird cracks me up. It often seems to think it's hiding better than it is. Appears to be a pair in the neighborhood. So here's the yellow-billed cuckoo. It does have um, some yellow on its bill. They have a, quite a long tail. And I, I like these photos here because, yeah, it looks like it's, <laughs> it's hiding. It's got the little greenery draped over its face there. And here's another really good photo of it there. You can see just it's like long and slim with a pretty long tail. So that's your yellow-billed cuckoo. And here, so here's what they look like. Like their name suggests, they do have the yellow bill there. And then they have this. Um, these white splotches on their tail as well. So now there is also 
a black billed cuckoo, which in previous years hasn't been as common as the yellow billed, um, but people have been reporting them. So I thought I'd play you their song as well. So here we go. So it's in more succession than the the, the yellow billed cuckoo. So it goes quicker, uh, but it also sounds kind of squeaky. And um, so these are the two different species that we have here with the yellow billed cuckoo that seeming to be the more common of the two. So keep your your eyes and ears out for them because they have been uh, seen around the area and especially in places where there's a lot of caterpillars. They eat a lot of caterpillars. So you could tend to find them in wooded areas where there's a lot of that kind of insect activity. Um, some really other neat sightings that have been out and about are indigo buntings. So normally when you see photos of indigo buntings or the bright blue male, uh, but here's a photo of the female, just to show you what it looks like. Uh, Mark snapped this photo at Mendham Ponds of a female indigo bunting with some nesting material. So she's got a little stick in her bill there. So she is doing some nest building, it would appear. And then Bob sent in this series of photos. He said, I had an amazing experience this morning. Thought I saw two male indigo buntings chasing each other. So I decided to investigate. I have to say I was very excited as this is one of my favorite birds. I ended up seeing not only two, but five male indigo buntings. They were chasing, singing, and often landing 10 feet from me. I did capture some photos, but I really just stood there in awe and took it all in. It was a memory I will keep with me for a long time. Nice to know there's still beauty in this world. So uh, Bob had some really great sightings of indigo buntings, and he sent in these photos here um, of a whole bunch of male indigo buntings. So gorgeous bird. Um, they will come to feeders here and there. And he also sent in these these photos here which are fun so did someone say finch food seed mix <laughs> and so um indigo buntings will sometimes come to feeders especially if you have feeders with small seeds in them and um, sounds like bob has our finch favorite mix in his feeder and that is a mix of niger seed and sunflower hearts ground up sunflower hearts and they really like those so they'll, they'll come to niger seed uh, but if you give them that finch mix that has a little bit of something extra in it that can help improve your chances so here's the indigo bunting feeding from the finch seed mix so they do like smaller size seeds so millet niger seed and the sunflower hearts are your best things that you can feed in order to possibly attract one of these so Beautiful indigo buntings. And here's another photo sent in uh, by Bob. He said, finally captured the male and female indigo bunting. This wasn't the photo I was going for, but I'll take it. So the, the female's there in flight, and then there's the male um, sitting on the ground. So some really neat indigo bunting activity um, at feeders, which is fun. The rose-breasted grosbeak activity seems to have dropped quite a bit, um, but the indigo buntings more than make up for it. And here is a cute series of photos sent in by Mark of Cedar Waxwings Courting. And he says, interesting to watch is they would pass food back and forth. And this is a behavior you might see cardinals do it, especially in your backyard where the male will grab some food and he'll feed the female. It's a behavior called aloe feeding. And it's just one way to strengthen pair bonds um, to have them feed each other. Nice uh, series of photos here of the cedar waxwings uh, next to each other and feeding each other. And more cedar waxwing activity here, sent in by Bob, who sent in this photo of a Baltimore Oriole and a cedar waxwing, saying Oriole and cedar waxwing hanging out together. So there's the two of uh, those birds um, just hanging out on a branch. So Orioles are definitely still around. Um, they seem to be uh, coming to feeders a little bit less now. Um, we'll probably see that continue to drop off um, as uh, as they're spending more time at their nests. Um, that being said, you can always put out mealworms that can help keep them coming, especially once those eggs have hatched. And then ultimately they tend to bring their young back to the feeders again. So um, there can be a gap there of sometimes as much is a month or you know three weeks where you don't see the orioles but then they do tend to come back so 
we do have a bit of a dry spell with them here and there. Um, here's a photo of a green heron if you're spending any time by the water. Of course, there's great blue heron, but you might just see a smaller species called the green heron. And this is a photo sent in by Mark of one of those. Great, great photo there. And flycatchers. Flycatchers can be difficult to identify because they, a lot of them look similar. So this is one of those instances where having the Merlin sound ID is really good um, because it can help you identify them based on their call. Here is a photo of a willow flycatcher at the Erie Canal sent in by Mark. Here's another photo of it. Um, the flycatchers, they a lot of them have very similar coloring, um, similar wing bars, so they can be a little tough to identify. Um, unless it's a big one like this, this is the great crested flycatcher. This is the largest species that we have here in the area, and they've, they're quite yellow. They're quite large, and then they're quite yellow um on their on their breast and they've got that gray head and they're a cavity nesting bird so you might see them in the woods um hanging out in that kind of habitat because they will nest in those hollow trees and warblers people are still um seeing some warblers this was sent in from by mark who is at montezuma and he says fun sightings from montezuma female american red start so this is the female american red start the male is black with orange on its wings where the female has yellow, the male has orange. And then also sent in these photos of the sandhill cranes with their young. So really cool photos here of the sandhill cranes with their babies. So that was over at Montezuma, really nice photos there. And there's more nesting activity going on. This is from Tinker Nature Park, also sent in by Mark of a pileated woodpecker. And you can see its chicks sticking their head out of the tree there, begging to be fed. So um, that's, that's the kind of behavior you can see right now. If you're spending any time in the woods, keep your ears open for those um, these chirps and the sounds of the chicks begging for food. And in the case of the pileated woodpeckers, the young do tend to stick their heads out of the tree and really beg for the food. So some really neat photos there of the pileated woodpecker and their chicks. And another cavity nester, here's a northern flicker that's sitting inside a hollow stump, could be sitting on some eggs. Um, so this was at lock 32. So another cavity nester here, the northern flicker. So it's that time of year. And then the young are starting to hatch and be out and about in the world. Here's a photo sent in by Karen. It says, first mallard family of the season on Canandaigua Lake. And boy, does she have her, uh, what would you say, her 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 feet full, <laughs> her, her, her hands full, her wings full here. She's got 10 chicks, it looks like here, that have hatched. So lots and lots of young there for the mallards. Um, so sometimes it's, it's quite amazing how many young a single bird will have. So that is the female mallard there taking care of all the babies. And it looks like they are underneath a feeder there, um, cleaning up a little bit of seeds that have spilled underneath the feeder. So neat sighting there. And another cavity nester, the chickadee. Um, this photo was sent in by Chris, who says the chickadee parents have been so busy feeding the babies in the stump. So those eggs have hatched. We saw early on, Chris had photos of the chickadees bringing the nesting material to the stump, and now they are feeding their young. So the eggs have hatched, and they are actively feeding the chicks. Now, here's a mystery bird. This is a difficult one. Uh, Bob sent in this photo. He says, good old bird identification. I have a photo that Merlin ID shows as a black pole warbler. I know it isn't the best photo in the world, but that is, that is the one and only choice Merlin gives me, which was surprising. I'm guessing based on the photos provided in Merlin, the adult female is a possibility. Anyone have any thoughts? I thought warbling vireo, but the eye does look a bit different. I finally ordered the Crosley ID guide, Eastern Birds, to help me get better at IDing. I'm getting them much better, uh, but some of the subs, uh, the, the subsidies, or yeah, uh, escape me. I did capture a black pole warbler on sound ID about a week ago. The photo I captured here is from Friday, May 27th. So this is a uh, this is a little bit of a difficult photo here, but you can see the um, the bird kind of peeking out here. So this is a zoomed in photo, and um, this is a difficult one. But it sounds like it might be the female black pole warbler. So this is the female 
on the left and then the male is on the right. So uh, Merlin has identified it as a black pole warbler. And it is hard to tell because it does kind of have that vireo, uh, does look a bit vireo-ish to me, but um, it, it's quite hard to tell. So I'm not totally sure on this one. So this is a mystery bird that was sent in by Bob. And so the, the male is quite easy to identify. It almost has the the, the, the same kind of cap as a chickadee, um, but it's, it's much more striped and not as gray as a chickadee. Um, but the, the female is, is more nondescript. And so Bob sounds like bought the Crosley ID guide, and that's this one here. And this is a really good book because it shows not only all the different plumages of the birds, but it shows them in their habitat where you could most likely see them. So this is a really good book if you're interested in upping your bird ID skills, the Crosley ID Eastern Guide is great. There's one for waterfowl as well, uh, but there's also the ducks are in the Eastern, um, the Eastern book as well. So um, some, some more warbler photos that were sent in by uh, Chris who went to Firehouse Woods and she sent in these photos. She said, here are a few, a few of the warblers I was able to find at Firehouse Woods on Saturday, May 14th. What an amazing day it was. Here is the Northern Perula. There's the chestnut sided warbler, the black throated green warbler, magnolia warbler, Wilson's warbler, and the bay breasted warbler. So lots of warbler activity going on. Um, they're starting to quiet down right now and settle in on nests and they're build, um, building their nests and sitting on their nests. So you probably won't hear them as much as you have been, but they are definitely still around. And hummingbirds are popping in and out of people's yards and feeders. Um, Bob snapped this photo of the hummingbird sticking its tongue out and says, is it something I said? Um, so here's a really neat photo showing how long those tongues are on the hummingbird. So if you look at hummingbird feeders, sometimes it can be um, kind of confusing to think, well, how can they actually feed from these? And they, they not only have those big long bills that they can dip into the feeder, but they do have those really long tongues um, to also drink from that nectar. So um, they can drink easily from feeders and those long tubular flowers. So here's a really funny photo of a hummingbird sent in by Bob. And there's also been some more nesting activity not only with bluebirds and chickadees and woodpeckers, but tree swallows. And um, this photo was sent in by Rich. She said, it's a bit fuzzy, but I caught this action shot of a tree swallow swooping around, checking out our bluebird house. The current residents are house sparrows. So here's a tree swallow checking out their bluebird house and some more tree swallow activity here sent in by Steve, who says our tree swallows have been back and have already produced their first offspring. We get to sit on the deck and watch them fly in formation every evening now, chattering to each other during flight training. So it sounds like the first round of tree swallow young have fledged from Steve's yard. And here's a photo of a tree swallow um, that I've got on top of one of my birdhouses. So they're just a gorgeous, gorgeous bird, bright, bright blue, bright iridescent blue with that white breast. So um, and then finally, now is a time where we do hear about this quite often, about window strikes. And Yvonne said in these photos, who, and she says, this bird flew into my school's windows not once but twice. I flipped it over to help it out. Left it alone after that to let it recover, but couldn't help but to take some pics. It's a thrush, I think. So during this time of the year, especially where there's birds migrating in and a whole bunch of the young, um, kind of more inexperienced birds around, window strikes can be a big issue. And you can put decals on your windows to help with that. Um, we have some like these here that are quite popular and they reflect UV light. So basically they look almost clear to us, but because they're on the outside of the window, they have a special paint that reflects UV light. So the birds can see that um, because they can see in the UV spectrum and that can help with window strikes um, like this one that Yvonne experienced. And um, yes, this does look like a thrush and it looks like a hermit thrush. And the thing that um, that, that says that to me is the bird is an overall pretty brown color, but an, it does have that chestnut colored um, tail here. So to me, this looks like a hermit thrush. So looks like it kind of righted itself. And 
hopefully they can shake it off. Um, but yeah, can be, window strikes can be a huge issue for songbirds, especially on big buildings, big tall buildings. So um, thank you guys for watching. Those are all your your photos. Um, we've got some people on. Dina says good morning. And Karen says good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sharon says good morning. Northern Orioles are still here. Sh uh, should should just put out a jar of grape jelly. Rose breasted gross beaks don't seem fussy about their meal. Regular bird seed mix. The hummingbirds loved your hummingbird mix. Oh, great. So sounds like Sharon is still getting quite a few Orioles, so much so she might want to just put out a whole uh, jar of jelly, which is great. And um, the rose breasted gross beaks, yep, um, depending on the mix you have, they are happy with sunflower seeds or happy with some safflower or striped sunflower. So, um, that will keep them happy and returning to your feeders. And um, the birds, she says, loved our hummingbird mix. We have a whole bunch of different types of hummingbird mixes that you can just add water to. We have some that are ready to use. So we do have lots of different hummingbird nectars available too. So it looks like that is everybody's comments and questions for the day. We'll be back on Saturday with another broadcast. And until then, enjoy your birds and have a great week. Thank you so much.